Welcome to the Cambridge Centre for Social Innovations webinar series, Beyond the Pandemic, Equality, Diversity and Inclusion. We explore why the values and practices of EDI need to be embedded in society's infrastructures. And at the core of this series are the personal narratives and experiences needed to influence how organisations, big and small, implement EDI. Our guest speaker is Eunice Baguma Ball, the Director and Head of Programmes of Africa Technology Business Network and also a graduate of our Masters in Social Innovation Programme. Thank you everyone for joining. My name is Eunice Baguma Ball um, and my talk today is going to be about what needs to change, uh, what needs to happen in tech for DEI to enable Black women to achieve success. Um, so um, I helped uh, found and I'm a director of a social enterprise based in London called ATBN, which is Africa Technology Business Network. Uh, and a lot of our work is around uh, supporting tech and innovation towards sustainable development in Africa. We do that through uh, working on various programs and partnerships with different funders, including we work with Comic Relief, Innovate UK, and most recently with the EU. Uh, and just really my whole, uh, a lot of my career, the past 10 years have really been working at the intersection of technology, gender entrepreneurship uh, for sustainable development. And very core to what I do and what I'm passionate about is uh, gender inclusion. So supporting more women into the tech space. Um, and part of that, uh, I helped initiate and set up something called the Coalition for Digital Equality, which is this a multi-stakeholder network focused on um, addressing the digital gender divide in Africa. Um, uh, and, and I've also published a book called Founding Women, which was just sharing the stories and spotlighting the stories of um, you know, different female entrepreneurs across Africa who are, are building businesses in the tech space, just to kind of try and showcase and sort of contribute towards changing the narrative. Uh, and like Pam mentioned, I. I'm a survivor of the MSD in social innovation, and I've had the privilege of some of my of having of being able to share some of my ideas and work, whether it's in writing or speaking on on a number of platforms, as you can see there. And I'm very, very um, excited to be uh, invited back to to the Cambridge Centre for Social Innovation to to share a bit about myself and my work. Um, so I want to start the talk with a bit of, no, no, it's not really a disclaimer, but I remember when Pam asked me to do this, I, I did have a bit of a, an imposter syndrome moment where I was kind of like, you know, diversity, equality and inclusion, you know, I think it's, it's, it's kind of become its own space and topic that has its own like growing vocabulary, things like microaggressions and conscious bias, allyship, and so I was like, that's, you know, that's not really what I do. You know, I support women in women entrepreneurs in tech, primarily in Africa and et cetera. But, um, you know, talking through to Pam, you know, we felt, and I hope that from today, there'll be lessons that I'm going to be speaking from my own personal experiences as a black woman, uh, working, navigating the tech space, both in Africa, which is where my career started and a lot of my work focuses and, and also in the UK. And also from my work supporting women entrepreneurs in tech, primarily in Africa, because I think that there is lessons there in some of the things that we're seeing that can um, help add, um, you know, bring a different perspective to some of the issues we see in diversity, equality and inclusion here in the UK. Um, so obviously there's no uh, one size fits all answers. I'm not a DI expert, but I hope that by the end of my talk, you have an, a, another perspective or another tool for your arsenal as we uh, work together towards building a more equal and just world or as we um, tackle some of the injustices that we see around us in the spaces that we go into. So I'll start with a personal story. Um, so I moved to the UK now about eight years ago now. Um, and before that I had, um, I did a, my, I did my undergrad in engineering and I'd been working in, in what was then really a nation, and I guess it's still nation, the tech space in Africa, you'd say is still nation now, but then it was really just kicking off because um, it was when mobile money, and I don't know if some of you have worked in tech in Africa, this, um, this thing where people could transfer money from one, you know, one person to another via basic mo uh, mobile phones had taken off. 
and it had really sparked like a fintech revolution. So I had um, I was working with a, a you know venture capital backed uh, US based startup that was building solutions in the fintech, uh, financial inclusion and a fintech space in East Africa. Uh, and so I'd really just really gotten excited and passionate about combining my technical background with entrepreneurship with the ability to build solutions that could actually impact people's lives. And that's really what started my whole journey and passion for tech for development. Um, and then I moved to the UK um, and I really wanted to stay working in tech. I really wanted to, I, I really liked, uh, also I forgot to mention that I also had a very short lived uh, tech startup that I founded myself as well. Well, there. So I'd, you know, worked for a startup for almost uh, two years. I'd run my own startup for, for about a year and, and I was really passionate about sort of the tech space. Um, and so when I moved to London with my husband, um, yeah, I wanted to get a job in tech. I wanted to learn everything that was uh, about building a startup and I wanted to work within the startup space. So I really got myself stuck in into the sort of silicon roundabout area google campus going to all these events and pitch events and um, networking and trying to build my network within the startup scene here in london and obviously i was looking for opportunities i was looking for job opportunities so i went to a lot of interviews uh, um, i got a lot of rejections as i think to be expected you know being new into a, a country trying to build your networks not having a previous experience here or even education here um, and so after a while, I, ha I had quite a bit of experience as a, an interviewee, I should say. Um, but I remember one particular interview, and I think it's probably one of the last interviews I did before I kind of gave up and said, you know what, I'm going to create the opportunity that I'm looking for, because it doesn't seem to uh, be out there. Um, but one of the last interviews I did, I think was probably one of the best interviews I've ever done, because I went in, did an interview, and then left and I think, you know, just walked and was like getting to the exit, maybe 10 minutes after I got called back and this, guy, and this person that had interviewed me was like, I was really impressed with you. Um, are you able to come right back and, you know, I want you to meet my boss. And then I went back in. So I literally just had like my second interview straight away with his boss. And then they asked me to come back in a couple of days later and do this pre a presentation on like my ideas for like strategy and growth and da da da. And they seemed, they seemed really impressed in terms of, I remember one of them distinctly saying something like, this is really impressive. It almost look, feels like you've, you've, you've had a peek at our strategy. You have some really great ideas. Uh, you've got a really good understanding of where we want to go and some really great ideas on how we can get there. But it was praise tinged with a sense of like disbelief. I don't know if anyone has been in, in that situation before. Um, and, and I went on to have quite a few similar interactions in interviews that there's always that you know that disbelief when you do something or do something well um and it made me think of just the power of stereotypes because since then i think reflecting back on my journey sometimes i sit back and i'm like you are this person you're this white male in tech startup world um you know when you and, and i have here on my screen you can see the image this the, the image on the on the right is when you google tech entrepreneur this is what you know, this is kind of what comes up. So that's somebody's idea of, you know, tech entrepreneur, somebody who would be working in a tech startup, particularly in like fintech capital of the world, you know, London. And then when you Google African woman, which is what I am, you know, you see the images on the right, right? So, you know, sometimes in my reflection since I, you know, as you imagine like the power of stereotypes, like you're sitting in front of this person who's trying to, you know, I, I always say I have three, I guess strikes against me, or you have three different, you know, sort of you're three times minority, or a woman, and then you're black, and then you're an immigrant, and not just any immigrant, but African, which, as we know, all not all immigrants are equal. Um, so it just made me realize the the power of people, even when presented with evidence to the contrary like they're sitting in front of this person who is telling them this, who they are impressed with, um, may not believe it. Because actually how the story ends is, I never ever heard back from these people. Literally, I was in contact with them, you know, because I had like three interviews in the space of a week, like constantly for that period. 
And after that presentation, I never, I never had back. I never got a rejection email, not even the standard, you know, thank you for your time, rejection, literally no callback, no feedback, no nothing. Um, so this is the power of stereotypes, that even when we are presented with evidence, the contrary, we, we can, there's all these barriers in people sort of getting over what they imagine somebody should look like in a certain space, whether, and, and in this case, I'm talking about the tech space. So when we look at my story and magnify it over, you know, the stories of th hundreds and thousands and you know, millions of, of female entrepreneurs or women in tech out there having these interactions, whether it's, it's in an interview or they're trying to raise funding, um, what does that look like? And I'm going to take, like I said, from my work with women entrepreneurs, the lens of, of, of entrepreneurship, right? So these interactions, when we, when, we, when we zoom out to a global scale, we start to see numbers like this, right? So um, a study by, by Brighter Bridges 2021 showed that between 2013 and 2021, only 3% of venture capital funding in Africa that went to African startups, only 3% went to female African female founders, 76% went to all male teams. Um, when you go to global figures, they don't look that much different. So it's not just a problem within Africa, it's a global problem. Uh, in the US, you know, it says only 2.7% of VC funding in 2019 went to women. And of that, less than 5%, so 0.37% went to black female founders. Uh, more, more, more figures. Um, so when, and that's on like, when we look at the receiving end, so people, entrepreneurs looking to raise funding, when we look at the who's making these investment decisions, um, only eight to 10% of senior investment professionals are women, 70% of investment, senior investment teams are composed of only men. So if you're going to look, raise funding, the 70% chance you're going to walk into a room and you're going to only, um, you know, be pitching or, or presenting or having your decision made by men. There's also really interesting studies that have looked at specifically studying the interactions that happen around these investment decisions. So one of my favorites is one um, that was done, which um, just analyzed the language used around um, when, when entrepreneurs came in um, asking for funding and how the funders evaluated different, how, whether it was a male entrepreneur or female entrepreneur. And one of the things they found was that actually the questions that were asked when it was a female entrepreneur were quite different from when it was a male entrepreneur. So when it was a female entrepreneur, there was a lot of emphasis on prevention focused questions. So how are you going to handle that competition? How are you going to uh, break into this, you know, um, how are you going to avoid this? How are you going to build, how are you going to avoid your team leaving? It was really like focused on, uh, on, on risk management. And when it was men, it was more of growth. You know, what are your projections for the future? Which markets are you looking at? How are you going to grow your revenue? And that matters because it, 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 it really puts the focus on, are you going to grow versus are you going to fail? Or are, how are you going to avoid failing? Uh, also another study found that um, analyzing the language used when um, funders, once the entrepreneurs left the room, how funders discussed the different uh, entrepreneurs presenting. And it was found that when they were evaluating women, even for the same sort of traits, the language used was different. So when an entrepreneur seemed quite young for a, a, a woman, uh, it would be like, she seems really young and inexperienced. For a, a young looking, a, a male entrepreneur looked young, it would be something like, oh, you know, he seems really young and, and energetic and he has a bright future ahead of him. Or things like if somebody came like very well dressed or seemed to have like very ambitious financial like um, uh, financial goals, for example, it was like, mm, she seems really, if it was a woman, it seemed like she seems really high maintenance or like has a really expensive lifestyle. And for the, uh, for the, yeah, for the man, it was something like, you know, they seem like they're going places, you know, they are people that seem to have, um, you know, really ambitious and, and going places. So again, this is about how these stereotypes and interactions are coming into play in these decision spaces 
that are then impacting and creating these numbers, these abysmal numbers that we are seeing, 3%, 2.7%, 0.37% of funding went to Black female uh, founders. A last slide on, on numbers. So let's look, when we look at it from sort of the racial point of view as well, um, some of the numbers I was able to find are less than 1% of VC backed founders in the US are black. Um, and in the UK, when you look at the decision makers or people within the venture capital space, less than 3% of professionals in the UK are black. And a very interesting study found that funds led by people of color were paradoxically less likely to gain support when they showed stronger performance, right? So the better you performed as a fund led by a person of color, the less likely that limited partners, these are the people who invest into the, give the funds, uh, were to invest in you. And it took me, for me, I mean, I don't know what the explanation to that is necessarily, but it took me back to like my own experience. It's that, that gender, that, sorry, that stereotype, which means that um, it, you, it can't be so. Something is not right here, and so I'm going to opt out. It doesn't fit into my expectation. Um, because this, this, this study actually went on to say, to find that when, when funds are led by people of color performed worse, then they, they got actually better evaluations from LPs. They were still not going to invest in them because they're not going to invest in something with poor performance, but they were evaluated more, um, they were evaluated better or more favorably if they showed weaker performance. So it's almost like, oh, you're fitting in your box. You're fitting into what I expect of lower performance. So therefore I'm going to be almost generous in this case because I'm still not going to give you my money. But uh, while it's, you know, if you don't fit into you're not, in, you're not fitting into the box that I expect you to fit in. It's like, that can't be right. And so I'm not going to, uh, I'm not going to believe that. So, right. So this is just painting a picture from personal narrative and then how it's playing out. All these interactions are playing out and, and, and to the numbers and, and, and we are seeing. So what are, solution, what are the solutions we're seeing um, coming up and, and there's something that I, 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 I am calling the fix them problem. Uh, somebody once, I, I, I put this quote here because somebody, I thought it was really good that somebody said women are over mentored and under sponsored. And there's a lot of people out there who say things like that. Women don't need more mentorship, they need funding. Um, I, I mean, I'm not that extreme. I, I obviously do believe there is, we do need to have mentorship and build business skills. But I think is there's, there's too much a strong focus on fixing individuals. So fix the women, fix the minorities. Uh, these approaches put the burden on the individual to be more confident, acquire more skills, but they don't really address the underlying issues. Um, so actually one interesting study um, by the IFC, the International Finance Corporation, found that business accelerators, it was the study done on accelerators in, in various emerging markets, actually increased the funding up for women entrepreneurs because what happened was that they didn't make much of a difference in terms of helping. So women led um, businesses that went through accelerator programs didn't necessarily raise any more funding than those that hadn't, but male led businesses that went through accelerators were more likely to raise funding because they'd accelerated their networks, et cetera. So that gap actually grew wider. And the reason is because the, you know, you're not really fixing the issue. You're, you're, yes, you're you know, helping women to pitch better or um, you know, present their businesses, you know, build their business models, but you're not changing the fact that they're going into an environment where the decisions are going to be made by certain people in a certain way. And there's only certain types of funding that favor certain types of businesses. Um, and one of the questions I have uh, for anyone out there who is interested in, in this research, I kind of hung up my research hat after my MST, but for somebody out there uh, who might be interested in pursuing this, one of the things I'm really curious about is all, you know, since this Black Lives Matter movement, we've seen a proliferation of programs supporting UK Black founders. And I'm really curious, is, are these initiatives working? Are they changing um, anything or is it again, a, a case of trying to fix the individual, but not really fi fixing the underlying problem. 
So what needs to happen? Um, and I say this humbly in that I, I don't really necessarily say I have the answers, but I think for me, what I have gravitated to a lot, uh, particularly after the you know exposure to the masters and, and really starting to think about uh, complex problems and uh, wicked problems and the complexity around this is this idea of systems change. The fact that there's a need to address systemic and structural issues that are keeping black women from succeeding in the state, uh, in the tech space. We need a, a shift of focus to developing long-term solutions that tackle root causes rather than quick fixes. Um, and for example, when I look at my example of my work and my space around women entrepreneurship, what this could look like, uh, and, and there's a lady uh, called uh, Suzanne Bigo who um, uh, leads an organization called Gender Smart Investing, who wrote a really good article that highlighted sort of three areas that um, can really help shift the needle for women-led uh, ventures and women entrepreneurs to get funded, which is you know changing things like diverse, diversifying the type of funding uh, venture capital is a very specific model that requires very, you know, it's a very high risk, high intensive, capital intensive model that um, that favors sort of certain types of entrepreneurship or certain types of venture. So diversifying types of funding, broadening and diversifying investor networks, you know, uh, increasing diversity, who is making funding decisions, um, creating investment processes that allow like, that address or allow that can tackle gender bias uh, issues or racial bias issues as well. So um, one example that I've come across in my work is um, there's an organization called Village Capital that have been pioneering this uh, a model called peer selection model where they when every time they run an accelerator program, the cohort is the one that decides who gets the investment amongst them. So obviously they're given criteria and Etc. So things like that, it's like blind selection, it, it, different processes that are changing or giving the opportunity for uh, for some of these biases to to not come into play when the funding decisions are being made. So these are just some examples, specifically from the space of funding, which could say are addressing sort of tackling some of the root causes. But when I say you know, what's needed is systems change. That's easier said than done. I saw this image of all these wires tangled up and going on all sorts of directions was a, a good, uh, you know, representation of, of systems change because you untangle one and another one tangles. And that's the issue with, with systems change is you need to know where you're create, taking action is going to have an impact on something else and somebody else is having an action and you need to have um, you know, you need to you need to be co collaborating with that other person. So, for example, when we say business accelerators, and I speak as somebody who I have run an accelerator for female entrepreneurs, and so when I see this study saying, "Oh, it may not actually make a difference," you know, you start to think, "All right, then what do we need to do? Right? Who do we need to?" You you quickly realize this is not something you can solve on your own. You're going to have to look at partners and look at what happens to them next and how to prepare them for the context in which they're going to actually be uh, trying to raise investment rather than saying, patting yourself on the back and saying, we've run an accelerator, we trained a hundred women, we've built their confidence, we've given them business skills, yay us, we've helped. Um, I think for me, what I've realized is that systems change requires A, collaborative efforts. So the recognition that you can't just solve your little piece and sort of leave it at that, you have to understand where you are in the system and kind of reach out to all the, partner, the, the, the other actors around that are working either before or after in the pipeline of the problem that you're trying to solve and figure out how you can work with um, together with them. There needs to be open dialogue with those uh, affected. So you can not just design a program for minorities, for women and expect it, it, it to work. It needs to be co-designed and developed and reiterated in you know in dialogue with our beneficiaries um things like constant re-evaluation um because again it's just the knowledge that every step we take has is going to have an impact in the system so you have to stop and then evaluate and understand have i you know have we have we have we made progress to where we want to go what are that could be the unintended consequences and last but not least for me you know 
system change or being an agent for system change requires humility to accept mistakes, to say, oh, what we did, um, maybe it had an internet consequences or maybe didn't really have the impact that we wanted it to have. We need to re rethink. Um, um, so while I may not say I know, you know, how do we affect system change? For me, these are some of the, uh, I guess, values or, or, or key themes that have, that have are brought into my work and try to guide my work as I try to, to be that agent or, or, or change. That's it really. So that's my, that's my um, I guess, two cents. Um, and like I said, for me, it's really about taking what I've learned and what I see in the space and thinking about what can I share that can help people, whatever it is, whatever area it is you're working in, whether it is in diversity, equality and inclusion as a leader, or if you're somebody within the space trying to figure out how to create space for other people, uh, or if you're running on designing programs, it was what can I share in, in from my story and from what I do that hopefully somebody can take away to think differently about uh, some of these problems uh, and, and some of the, uh, how, they can, how, how they themselves can create some change. So I welcome any questions. Thank you, Eunice. Um, so basically, I just want to thank you very much for doing that. It's really interesting. And I know that when I asked you, you were just like, Pam, what do I know about this? But what sort of prompted um, this webinar series was to try and understand the personal stories and you have shared yours with us. But what I'm interested in finding out, I think as well, is um, <laughs> there's always a positive we know that to, to the implementation of, of EDI, but what do you think could be the negative impact of people trying to push through something that perhaps they don't, they don't really know how to make work? So how do you mean, like if somebody has like an EDI like intervention that they're trying to push yeah. through? Yeah, I mean, I think it's, it's like I said with the, you know, that study with the accelerators and finding because, you know, and this is a thing, I think one of the things I, I, I want to highlight about um, systems change is you have to be able to question the assumptions that we take for granted or question the system, right? So accelerators are like this thing that's like, it's like the standard for how you build you know, business skills or support entrepreneurs to move from A to B in their business. And it's just taken for granted, like this is how you do this, right? So there's a lot of things we take for granted, even in, in like EDI, like, yeah, what do you do to increase pipeline or maybe it's uh, put quarters or it's make sure you have one of each on, on a pan interview panel or it's do a mentorship program matching. You know, there's certain things that we've taken for granted. Like once you do this, it will solve the problem. And so I think what I want people to take away and remember is we need to question all those things because those things have been happening and are happening and we're not seeing a big change. So if we really, 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 really want to shift the needle, we have to be willing to even question those things that we pat ourselves on our backs for and think that we are doing the right thing or we've done our job. You know, a lot of people now, you know, if you hire a DI, DNI person, a lot of companies just tick the box. I have a, a friend who's just quit working for a large corporate as, a, as their DNI because she just realized like literally that was the action. <laughs> the action was, hire a dni person who looks the part done and they were really not willing to do any of the work to actually to do that so i think it's just going beyond the gestures going beyond the usual um and being that humble or being that open to saying actually even the things that we assume or have been the standard may not be taking us in the right direction and, and constantly having that evaluation and I think that information is not very far like I said in terms of if you're in open conversation with the actual people affected right so if companies are actually listening to um, rather than saying oh we've hired x percent 
uh, black people or minorities in our organization take if they're actually having dialogue with the people in organizations wonder if they're not retaining them there's a lot of organizations out there who are like oh we we increased our hiring but then they always leave so and we don't know why like they're not having that conversation and actually fixing some of those issues so yeah for me it's just all about question the system and be willing to go beyond the assumptions of what we think is you know sort of gold standard as this is what this is what we do this is what works and sort of ticking uh, ticking off boxes I mean, there's a danger, isn't there, with the box ticking exercise that actually all you're doing is reinforcing stereotypes. Exactly. Yeah. And even making things worse. I, I think I think th that's where the humility comes in. Like, imagine trying to do the right thing, being a social innovator, being somebody that's really just trying to do good, and then eventually finding out that this thing that you're doing is making things worse. I think there's a lot of humility needed to be able to acknowledge that um and i think as social innovators it just has to be part of that because it's not easy to it's not easy to say that and especially within the context you work maybe you've had to lobby internally to get funding to do this initiative or in my case i've had to raise somebody's funding like to be able to, to go and say this this actually didn't work or didn't you know it's not, it's not, like I said, I think there's a lot of stuff that's easier said than done and, and fine, maybe you don't have to write an impact report that says, you know, we made things worse, you know, say all the achievements you made, but for yourself as somebody that's serious about creating real change, then don't do it that way again, right? Take those learnings and, 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 and figure out what it is that's actually going to make a difference. You mentioned earlier, of course, the work that you have been doing in Uganda, um, and you also mentioned the fact that research has shown that, you know, the worse, the more poorly somebody does, the more praise they're likely to get. They're not going to get the money necessarily, but, oh, you, you know, you've made an attempt, you've, you've tried to make it work, yay, good for you. Um, with your work in Uganda and actually your work in the UK as well, how are you enabling and empowering people, women, to kind of buck the trend, as it were, of EDI, kind of say, okay, yes, we get that that's what's going on, but this is how we're going to succeed. This is how we're going to, to get through it. And you might, I mean, you might not have any kind of clear solutions to that, but there must be some sort of element of you that understands that what you're doing is helping them to, to, to fight that system. To be honest, I think for me, one of the things that I've found, um, um, I guess, most impactful is just um, showcasing and creating platforms for people that have backed the train, people that, you know, like I said, with my founding women book, sometimes it just takes somebody hearing a story of somebody that went through all of these things and, and has still done it this way for that person, for, you know, another person to keep going. My, my, my own um, story as well. Like I said, like, you know, I went through all this process of trying to find jobs and getting all of this, you know, experiences and, and biases um, as I, I as I went through the interview process and eventually deciding to set up my own organization. And the reason I went ahead to do that is I remember very, very distinctly going to a talk. Um, it was at Google campus and the lady who was leading that talk was an uh, a lady I think from India and she had you know she was clearly like new immigrant like me she had like a not like British Indian but like she like had a proper Indian accent and she was leading this fintech um, meetup and there was hundreds of people in the room and she's the person who had set it up and there was just something about the idea that somebody moved to this country just like me didn't have the networks and now was like commanding a room of hundreds of people and talking about fintech in the UK and globally leading that conversation that was just like the permission I needed to um, go out and set up my own organization. So um, I think the power of, of stories is really what helps people because I think I, I, until until the system changes, you, you have to just empower people to continue to push despite what they're coming across. And I think um, stories are really a powerful way of doing that, like highlighting different, sharing our stories and highlighting how we have maybe um, overcome these barriers ourselves. 
Thank you. Anybody have any questions that they would like to ask? Go ahead, Robert. Hey, I thank you, Eunice, for your very inspiring sharing about uh, how you like go for different pitching and like could turn turn into a very good social and uh social innovator and social business in ATBN. I just checked the, the web your website. It seems that you ATBN is doing different different program and different work. So uh can I can I ask like uh when you start doing this uh, small st startup, you concern about the difference program first or are you concerned about the, the concept first or the business model first because right now when i uh, have a look at your the website it seems you have different like services and product and and with different uh, revenues coming in but at the very beginning say a, a few years ago it should not be that established so how you, you start from concept with different uh services in your mind then you do it step by step or just test one and add one and the other one. How how to come up this building Legos exercise and come up today? Yeah. <laughs> um, so I think obviously it's evolved. I've been doing ATBN now for five years. Um, and I think initially it was about um, starting with where there was sort of momentum and need. So initially when I started ATBN, it was, and that's why it's called a network. It was essentially bringing people together to share with them um, opportunities uh, and, and, and what was happening in the tech space. So what I discovered was a lot of people in the UK were not aware of what was happening in the tech space within Africa and some of the opportunities that were coming up there, whether it was investment opportunities or business opportunities. So it, it was really about bringing these networks together and bringing people together. And we used to run a conference, for example, and then the conference became, oh, can we inve connect investors and entrepreneurs um, and then uh, around that time, there was a lot of interest for also development partners because there was a, a shift happening around the traditional way that aid or development is done in Africa from a very, um, you know, let's go and give out mosquito nets to let's enable innovation. And so with that, what we were doing and the conversation we're leading around technology in Africa attracted partners to us who are saying, oh, we think technology can be a, a very useful tool um, to help empower women's businesses. Can you work with us to run a program? So it really became about, um, for me, it just, it came about bringing the right people together and then seeing where the conversation or where like the, the momentum built around that. So it wasn't very <laughs> systematic to be honest, especially given that I started the business as almost a necessity entrepreneur. So I'm sorry, that's probably not the most inspiring answer, but that's where it's kind of evolved. I would say today, um, I have had a shift uh, and, and, and I think this was really around me doing the MST as well from doing any program that any development fund I wanted me to do to saying, I really want to do things that, that create systems change. I want to do things that are sustainable. So rather than somebody giving me money and saying, go and run this program in Ghana, it's like, how can I enable a local organization to run this program in Ghana so that they can run it next year and the year and the year after that, right? So there was, for me, it's now become much more strategic and much more around systems change and now five years later because i'm in the position that i have that credibility and, and sort of projects under my belt i'm able to do that but you're not always able to do that when you're starting out your social enterprise um rahil has asked is there a crossover is there a way to take from other areas that are working with edi um perhaps successfully or more successfully uh, than others and bring it into um, the financial sector, into the social entrepreneur uh, sector. Yeah, I mean, I think, yeah, where there's lessons to learn or to be uh, taken, you know, definitely, yeah, the, I'm sure there'll, there'll be crossovers. If, if, if people have done a really successful program or initiative or intervention that's made a difference in one sector, definitely there's learnings that can be uh, taken in other sectors. The only thing that I would say to that, and I think Pam, when we did the podcast, I said this again, is 
I'm always conscious with this idea of trans, like you can transfer something from one context to another, whether it's geographic or sector, because, you know, there's so many things that are really, you know, I, I guess one of our first, very first lectures at the MST was like social problems are socially embedded, you know, so things are really embedded in their context, um, even within the same country, even within the same, you know, um, you know, sort of social context, they can be very different factors that drive, you know, for example, like I said, when I, when I give the, the example of, of VC or funding, you know, like, like funding, it, it's a very, very, you know, it's a sector where, you know, it's very subjective, it's very high stakes, it's very, people make decisions. Um, and, and, and so, yeah, it, I think every sector has that very specific context that has to be taken into account before you, you transfer, but definitely take learnings. Yeah, I completely agree. Um, hi, everyone. Hi, Eunice. Thank you so much. That was really insightful. I really enjoyed the section about funding in particular. Um, and I really can't help thinking, of course, there's an issue with, with the funding, but there's one figure that you mentioned is I think 1% of US founders are, are black or like US VC backed founders are black. So actually we are also dealing with a relatively small pool. So other, there's all these initiatives to empower, of course, black people of color within the tech world. I'm just wondering, do you think the tech space could be doing more to actually encourage younger um, people of color, black children like at school to actually think of the tech space and how, how can the tech space, again, like fight these stereotypes and make it something achievable for these kids? Absolutely. And I think this is exactly when, when you start to put on a systems thinking hat that you start to think like, oh, actually, even this initiative I have to support black founders is only going to support the one percent how do we get you know how do we get the one percent to how do you even get a, a chat you know it comes maybe um you know doing a tech startup or working in 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 venture capital means that you have to choose certain courses at university and or it means that you have to get into certain universities like when you start to think in those terms then you're really starting to see that whatever intervention we have, these uh, nice DEI, DEI programs are literally just the tip of the iceberg. And I had that that image there for that. Um, so it really t takes us, and, and that's why for me, like I said, it, it can be overwhelming to try and think of how do I affect systems change? Because when you think about, when you see it in its entirety and it, the complexity and how far back you would have to go to really fix the problem, you can't get overwhelmed. You're not going to run a program from cradle to, you know, IPO, <laughs> you know? So um, I think, and that's where it comes up with saying the collaboration. And, and that's why I said, I, when, when I get overwhelmed, um, one of the things I go to is I think stories and sharing those stories because those can always go back into how do you, you know, once you've run your program for uh, black female founders, there is another organization out there that's working with kids in schools. Can you take those founders that you're working with to expose, you know, it, it, it doesn't have to be you. There is that collaboration. Once you think about it and you think about like, I'm part of this system and there's this pipeline and I'm only working in this bit, then you start to have ideas on how can we affect change even from the other side by say collaborating with the organization. One of my colleagues on the MST, Richard actually uh, has a social enterprise that's about uh, helping uh, people from, um, you know, bl young black people from uh, sort of low-income communities in London to get into uh, Cambridge and Oxford and sort of high universities. And he's, you know, sort of partnered with different corporates in terms of take, you know, showing role models or getting getting them to apply. So things like that. So once you get out of this idea that oh, I've done this great program, it's doing great. Then you start to think of all these ideas and all these collaborations come up. So yeah, just very, thank you, Sarah, for that question, because I think it really just really like brings the point home that whatever it is you do, you're still only probably addressing just a tiny bit of the challenge. And so tackling the system, you have to think way broader than that. And it's something that you're, you're probably never going to do or just working on your own. Thank you for the, um 
at all, Eunice. So one quick question is how much of system change can be um, tackled through generational change or generational differences between baby boomers and the older generation and Gen Z? Because obviously you're seeing young people going out to protest, being more diverse, being more open, being more aware of different cultures. And that's naturally, hopefully, going to change how they view the world and treat ethnic minorities. And I'm not necessarily saying like the older generation are more like, they're probably less attuned to being in integrated circles and understanding the issues and, and, and the depth that younger people do have, do, do. So I guess how much of system change needs to happen or, or will be kind of dealt with through just the generational changes over time? Yeah, and that's a really interesting question. Um, and yeah, I think on, I, I guess what you're saying is on one hand, there is like a natural systems change that's going to happen just from, you know, different generations having, you know, sort of different mindsets and um, stuff. But I think, you know, if I, I guess through, I, I don't have that, I, I don't have an answer to that, but I think it's a very interesting question. And just reflecting on it, let's think about, you know, other things that have happened across, you know, generations and the way certain things may be going. Um, you know, across generations, we're also seeing generations getting poorer, for example. And like we are, you know, there's generation now that cannot afford to have houses or pay for houses, but compared to the previous generation, or when you think about um, things like climate and, you know, like it, it can go either way, like depends on what social problem you're looking at. Like generationally, there's things that are going, I guess might be going better. Fine, young people are getting more climate aware but the decisions that this generation makes now is going to have an impact on what even the next generation is going to be able to even do, like to the options that they will have before them to actually make a change. So I think um, as much as it's, it's a cool idea to imagine that, yeah, things are going to change anyway, because you know this, gen this generation is much more aware, much more diverse. I think it's just much more complicated than that because of the legacy that they will have to work within that we leave behind, if that makes sense. 